You know, Jesse Gascon earlier was talking about, uh, you know, how, how important uh, zero defects or being as close as you can to that is to Shimano. You think if the SIS system hadn't have been engineered correctly, if that had come out and been a flop, would that have put uh, Shimano into maybe what Suntour is today? I mean, that was a critical well, moment Shimano for the was, company. When Shimano introduced the index system, we were not a major player. Suntour was dominant in the mountain bikes. Campy was totally dominant on the road. Shimano might have had 10% market share at best. And so and that it was at the low end, wasn't it? Uh, or the middle? Well, we had, we had maybe 5 or 10% even with Dura Ace, the AX, and the mm -hmm. EX. Uh, they had some good pro products and some things that weren't quite as durable as they needed to be for the pro racing circuit. I think what's exciting about Shimano is the philosophy that we have a lot of engineers in our company now and a lot of people like myself that came from a racing background and are working on product development that look at what's out there and say, if I were to dream about what I would like it to be, it would be better than that. And we think about when we're developing a product, once we get to the point where we say, wow, I don't want to ride the other stuff anymore. Uh -huh. I, want to, I want to ride this new stuff. It's that much better. Then we know we have something that we could introduce and obsolete things that we've already made. If you, if you can't obsolete things, you get stuck into a compatibility trap where you can't ever improve to the next level. Right. But if you're going to make that step and you are going to obsolete things, you know that a lot of your customers are going to be upset that the new stuff doesn't work with their old stuff. And so it had not better not be just a tiny step or something that no one can notice. It's got to be a big step. And when we come out with generations of XTR or Dura-Ace where people like in the industry like Gary Fisher on a mountain bike, mm -hmm. we came out with the first um, index shifting on a mountain bike or the first XTR group and he comes back from a training ride and he says, I've got to get that on my bike. I don't want to ride the other stuff anymore. I need that as soon as possible. And that generation, Gary Klein was the same way. So, so on that note, the timeliness, Wayne Stetna, who we're being joined by, is out on a ride. You have an amazing idea, an epiphany, if you will. How long until you can go from that idea to seeing that product in, in a bike shop? Assuming it's a, it is a good idea and the, the engineering is realistic. Oh, sometimes to develop an idea could take two or three years. I've had situations, though, when we did the first generation of the dual control shifters, mm -hmm. I was in Japan. I had an idea of how to relocate the, the trigger release to where it currently is because we had a problem with where to put it and we couldn't figure it out and it was accidentally shifting where you didn't want to shift but you couldn't reach it when you needed it. And two days later they had the samples made the way I'd suggested. Wow. And I came back a month later, I went home, I came back to Japan, I got a set, I flew to Boulder and I put it on Andy Hampton's bike and he rode it in the Tour of Americas. So they moved just that fast from a prototype to something that we could give to a guy who had just won the Giro the previous year and be confident to send him out into a bike race. Wow, that is amazing. So it took us two years from that point. It was not till fall of the following year that Phil Anderson had a set that we really were happy with the crash durability, that he won the Nissan Tour of Ireland, and we didn't get it into the market until I think eight or nine months after that. Actually, the year after Phil won the Tour of Ireland in 91, I went back to the Tour DuPont. I think, it was, I think it was DuPont that year. I don't know if it was Trump or DuPont. But 91, and Phil was teammates with Steve Bauer and with uh, Davis. And I was trying to get them to try it. And Davis is thinking, and he's <laughs> telling me, look, Wayne, there's no way I'm putting that on my bike the day before the stage race starts. There's just no way. And Bauer was a little more flexible, so the mechanics had just got done installing it on his bike. And I said, look, Davis, just go ride Steve's bike around the block and come back and tell me you don't want to ride it, and I won't bug you uh -huh. anymore. But just, okay, I'll, I'll, for, I'll do that for you. So he goes out and comes back 15 minutes later. 
and he's got this big grin on his face. He said, put that on my bike. I want to race on that. It gave him a competitive advantage. Well, I mean, he could, Dave Steve smart Tilford guy. told me that it was the most annoying thing ever that the whole, every stage, Davis is riding up and down through the bunch saying, hey, look at this. I can shift gears just like this. This is unbelievable. And people were just, they were getting tired of it. Yeah. But he did win several sprint stages from Olaf Ludwig, who he had been narrowly losing to before. So it may have given him the edge that, uh, that he needed because you didn't have to pick the gear before the sprint and be stuck with that gear all the way through. You could start off in an easier gear, do your acceleration, and just go into your top gear right when you needed that final burst of speed. So it's interesting we've talked about some major developments that have happened just in the last couple decades. It's getting harder and harder to find that cherry to pick now, isn't it? To find, like, if you could think of one part on the bike that really needs to be improved or w would benefit the most from improvement, what would it be? Well, for what we make, uh, I mean, Shimano's made tremendous strides in wheel technology, mm -hmm. and I think that just as our shoes have become uh, comparable with anybody's shoes, our wheels are at that same point, and we have designs coming that may leapfrog uh, everybody else in wheel technology, but there's still a long way to go in shifting. And is three it, years is ago... Is it electronic? Is it air? What is it? <laughs> You can't, you'd have to three kill me, three years you? ago, I would have said there's very little room left to improve on the mechanical 10 speed we've got. The effort is so light, it's so quick, it's so responsive, and I've ridden systems, I've done a lot of testing, things that shift almost twice as good as what we've got now. Yeah, sometimes it's like uh, twice as good as perfect, you know what I mean? But so. Well, well, here's what I thought, is what difference will it make? And I spent two years uh, consecutively going over to Belgium the week before the Amloop Hep Volt, mm -hmm. so the end of February, testing on the cobbles in 30 to 35 degree weather. And I found when I'm riding with the Rabobank Pros that we were testing with, you're bouncing around so much, as easy as the current shifters are to operate, it's still an effort to operate those, particularly the front chain ring as easy as the Shimano shifts, you, you have trouble in that adverse environment right. actually going from your small ring to your big ring. On that note, Wayne, uh, we're talking about the Rabobank team, Gord Fraser called in a couple days ago and let us know that it was, uh, well, Oscar Friere was the most recent uh, current road champion to race in America. So I just wanted to clear that up because we gave bad information. So, you know, on that note, Wayne, I just want one last question. Are you going to be racing again out there again next year with the same bigger yeah I yeah got, I got fourth at nationals this year and I thought I was ready and uh, it was a tough tough course it was perfect for you it was perfect yep. except I got dropped because the other guys went too fast they, they, so you know have you noticed and Dave has kind of alluded to this before but it's pretty amazing the level of competition in master racing these days isn't it there's a lot of strong guys out there it's not just ex pros that race it's guys that found the sport in their 40s yeah, the, the problem is, I think personally, I do a lot of product testing and a fair amount of traveling, but I'm not willing to enter the races every weekend. And if you don't race constantly against the top guys that are winning, you can be very competitive, but it, you're just missing that, that last edge, huh? one yeah. or two percent that you need right. in order to win. So I'm still not willing to uh, spend all my weekends going to bike races. I've, I've done that and it's, I'll, uh, I'll keep trying to do it uh, the way I'm doing it and I try to stay fit and healthy. I can still go out for five or six hours with uh, even a pro tour team when they're training mm -hmm. at reasonable tempo as long as they're not doing any kind of anaerobic threshold work right. on the climbs. I'm That's okay. going to be a great feeling. And yeah. I go back to Tucson. I've been in the top 10 uh, two years ago. This year I got 19th at Tour of Tucson. Uh -huh. So I think that that's, um, there's you a lot no of pros. Plan on, no plan on changing going forward, it sounds like, at least for the time being. Well, no, I'm, uh, as long as I can enjoy cycling and it's fun, and people say, why don't you ride time trials? I say, that's not fun for there me. You. Why would I want to go race Ken Bostick? <laughs> But it is fun road racing, and you're still doing it. So I think you've been a great ambassador for the sport, not just Shimano. So thanks a lot for coming by, Wayne. Thank you very much. So Dave Toll signing off here for Shop Talk with Wayne Stetna. We'll see you out on the road.